The conversation we're about to have now, I'm gonna to bring to the stage in just a moment, Blair Taylor, who's the chief community officer of Starbucks. And Blair and I and Citizen University and Starbucks have worked together in deep collaboration in a lot of ways. And the reason why is that, as Blair is going to explain, they recognize that, yeah, they're in the coffee business and we are all uh, uh, addicts, okay. Uh, I was gonna find a, a, a better word, but thank you, addicts. Um, but Starbucks is also a set of places. It is a set of places and community and citizenship begin with how we foster and nurture that sense of place. And so the opportunity that we have now in hearing from Blair Taylor um, is an invitation, an invitation to imagine what it means to hold a space, make a space, claim a space, and use it to create community and to foster citizenship. Please welcome to the stage Blair Taylor from Starbucks. Thank you, my friend. Well, good afternoon. Now, I got to tell you, I'm going to feed off of your energy. So you need to take a cup of that coffee that's coming around in a moment. Uh, let me try that one more time. Good afternoon. Hey. All right. It is a pleasure to be here with you. I want to just take a moment and thank Eric Liu uh, for all of the work that he does around the country moving forth issues that matter. Thank you, Eric. Thank you. You know, he's a very humble guy, but we, we appreciate you. I just want to pause for a moment, and sometimes you're running through this kind of a day and you don't get the recognition. I want to let you know how much we appreciate you, so thank you, Eric. Thank you for all you do. Now, one of the things Eric's very good about is he's very good about telling you, you know, you got exactly uh, X number of minutes up on the stage and don't go over. So um, I threw away my three hours of remarks that I had prepared and uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to hit this really quickly because the point of today is not so much to hear me stand up and speak to you. The point of my involvement and Starbucks involvement today is to hear from you and to hear from you with ideas on how we can better plug into communities across the country and even communities across the world. Now, my job as chief community officer is a great job. I have all of our government affairs I have all of our efforts around community affairs and several of our team members, Starbucks team members, can you guys wave from the back? Rodney, Tony, Andrea are here, Kelly, uh, Colleen. Uh, I know there's several members of our team who are here. But my responsibilities cover government affairs, cover our community affairs, covers our corporate social responsibility, so all of our ethical sourcing, all of our efforts around environment fall into my group, as well as our efforts around corporate diversity. All a great group of, of activities and things that we do that I'll talk more about in just a second. Recently, I had added to my portfolio all of our human resources. So we have 200,000 employees whom we call partners around the world. So I'm now also sitting over our internal community. And the reason why that's so exciting to me is the synergies between our internal community and our external community are enormous. Let me give you just one example. In my time at Starbucks and going around to all of our stores and talking with our partners, one of the things that became clear to me is about 60 to 70% of our partners in our stores join Starbucks because of our commitment to community. That means we have a force of power de jour that we can turn loose and which we do as a force for change and a force for good. There are really two reasons beyond that why I'm so excited about this position. One is the commitment that this company has to the betterment of communities around the world. And I told a story yesterday to a smaller group, which I'll tell to you quickly, and that is the story of how I joined Starbucks. I was off running a nonprofit doing a lot of the work that many of you are doing, one of the larger nonprofits in the city of Los Angeles. And it just so happened that right down the street from my headquarters was a Starbucks store, which in the 08, 09 recession and turn back of the economy, Starbucks decided that they were going to close that store. Well, this was my store, okay? This was right down the street. I said, no way are you guys closing our Starbucks store. 
So I did what every good CEO of a nonprofit does. I wrote a letter to Howard Schultz, and I said, you can't close this store. We need this store to be open. By the way, we're doing a whole vibrant effort to restore this neighborhood, spending $25 million over the next several years. We need Starbucks to be there. And by the way, while I'm at it, let me put a little footnote in here about what I think you're not doing in communities across the country. I said, while I'm at it, I might as well throw that in, right? So I'm walking back to my office a couple weeks later, and I get a phone call, and my administrative assistant says, you know, Howard Schultz is on the line. He'd like to speak to you. I said, I said wow. It's a big moment. So I walked into my office. I picked up the phone. He said, hey, Blair, it's Howard. He said, I got your letter, and it's a very thought-provoking letter. He said, what I want you to do is fly up here and meet with a team of us to talk about how we can better serve communities across the country. And I did. I flew up a couple of weeks later, had a two-hour conversation with Howard and his senior team, which, by the way, resulted in many of the things that we're now doing today at Starbucks. And I point that out because that's the kind of company and that's the kind of CEO that Howard Schultz is. He's deeply concerned about doing the right thing in communities across the globe. Yes, we are a for-profit company, but there's nothing wrong with that as long as that for-profit company also has a conscience. And so that's one reason why I'm so excited. The second reason why I'm so excited, quite frankly, is probably not a very good reason. And, it, and the reason is that there's an enormous need. And you all have talked about that in many of the sessions already today, and you'll continue to talk about it throughout the day. But let me just give you a couple of quick examples. I think today there has never been a need for corporate America to step up and step in more than what we are faced with right now in this country, <laughs> ever. Now, I've done the work. I've been out there in inner cities working with young kids in schools where 60% of the kids are dropping out. We have a 15% of our population now is below the poverty level. It's outrageous. Access to the middle class is evaporating in this country. And yet we're a country that was built upon access to the middle class. If you look at us relative to other countries around the world, all, by almost every standard, we are falling back. Or at best, we're staying where we were while other countries are passing us and devoting themselves to a fully college-educated workforce and the like in the 21st century. So the need is great, which brings me to what Starbucks can do as a for-profit company. Now, I will tell you, I think this company has done a lot of good things over the years. And if you don't mind, I'd like to take a moment, literally two minutes, and just show you a quick video that tells the story of how we impacted two young people from very different parts of the world because we made an investment personally in their lives. So at our annual shareholders meeting a couple of days ago, we showed that video, and then we brought these two young woman, women out on the stage. Their stories are phenomenal. And so we're making investments in young people like that all across the world. But what I want us to do today over a conversation over coffee, and by the way, you're, you're hopefully sampling and having a chance to taste our Pike Place uh, roast, which is one of our most popular coffees in our Starbucks stores, so enjoy that. Um, little Starbucks commercial that I just put on there for a moment. But um, enjoy the coffee because what we want to talk about is how do we stimulate these kinds of coffee conversations across the globe and across the, uh, across the country. So if you look at that video with those two young people, certainly we are affecting lives individually. But the question is, how do we build that and take that to a bigger scale? And so this is something that we're wrestling with inside of Starbucks. And in a moment, I want to ask your help in helping to, us to think about how we use our scale for good. That's the terminology that we use within Starbucks. I want to give you just a couple of examples of how we're thinking about using our scale for good. So here's one. Starbucks has 19,000 stores across the world. We have 70 million people who come through our stores every single day across the world, 70 million. We have a supply chain that is 15,000 vendors deep. So we got to thinking about all that. We thought maybe there were ways we can tap into that and change the world and make it a better place. One of the things we announced at our shareholders meeting was an initiative called the supply chain as a force for good. And what we're doing is we're tapping into the power 
of our multi-billion dollar supply chain and asking them to come along and ascribe and share the values that we have. And in so doing, we're creating a 501c3 where the, the, the 501c3 will be a shared participant, uh, shared with the participation of our suppliers, and they will contribute funds into this 501c3, which will then put these funds out into the world to do good, which means that we'll be able to make bigger investments in young people, specifically around job training and leadership and leadership skills development. Now, somebody says, what's the big deal there? First of all, it's never been done. Secondly, we believe that over the next five years, we can build a $100 million fund from the contributions of our suppliers and Starbucks. Now, that's tapping into our scale for good. I'll give you another example of using our scale for good. Next month is what we call our global month of service. It means that we have our Starbucks partners, our employees, our partners around the world contribute time to their communities to make their communities better. Now, this has been tremendously successful. Last year, we had more than 600,000 hours of volunteer time given by our partners and by our customers, by the way, who joined our partners to do good things in the community. But what if we thought about Global Month of Service a little bit differently and said, instead of Starbucks doing it by ourselves, what if we locked arms with other corporations and said, all of us, let's intensively focus on changing communities for the better during the month of April. And so this year, we're starting that process. And we're going to be announcing in early April five different partners, who are corporate partners, who are going to work with us on Global Month of Service during the month of April, locking arms to change communities around the globe for, better, for the better. And by the way, I will be able to tell you that the first one of those partners is right here in Seattle. And it's our friends from Alaska Airlines who will be lining up with us to change neighborhoods in Seattle together <laughs> in April. One more quick example. In that conversation I had with Howard Schultz that day and his team at that time, part of what we talked about was how hard it is as a nonprofit to raise money. And that we evolved those conversations and they ultimately landed on a concept which we now call the Starbucks Community Store. And let me tell you quite simply what a community store is because we're going to be doing one in Seattle this year. A community store is a store where Starbucks shares half of our profits with a community-based organization. Now, anybody who runs a nonprofit knows. Anybody who runs a nonprofit knows how hard it is to raise money. And by the way, it's a tough, tough business because typically when the economy's down, what happens to your business? It's booming. And, and that's the time where you need support from corporations and philanthropists, right? And that's the time when they say, eh, the economy's tough. We don't have any money to provide for you, right? So it's a, it's a counter-cyclical business model against a cyclical business cycle. Bad combination. So we thought about that at Starbucks over the last couple of years, and we came up with this community store model. This community store model is now operating in three different cities, Los Angeles, Houston, and Rodney, what's the third city? New York, Harlem, right? So three cities, we have three stores. These stores are receiving approximately $125,000 per year from Starbucks as contributions to their operations and allowing them to reinvest those dollars in programs that serve communities. Now, let me tell you what the scale for good piece of this is. Because just Starbucks doing that alone will never change a neighborhood, will never change a city. But if Starbucks can do that effectively and then bring along other corporations that, will, that are in the neighborhood with us, that will donate half of their profits back to that neighborhood, we can transform a community, right? So just a few examples of the kinds of things that we're doing here and across the globe to try to use our scale for good. So let me dovetail this into what I want to ask you to help us with today. Because with 19,000 stores across the world and 70 million transactions per week and 6 million people now online with, Star with my Starbucks reward cards, we believe we have a chance to use that as a force for good. But the question of the day is, how can we most effectively use our stores as mechanisms to not just help stimulate dialogues in neighborhoods, because that's one way, that's important to have those conversations over coffee. But how can we best utilize them as forces to help change this country for the better, one neighborhood at a time? 
And I'd like for you to think about that with us today and give us your thoughts and reflections. Let me give you just one idea that's come up on our end, which I think is a powerful one. So if you walk into a Starbucks store today and you look around, and most of them you'll see somewhere in the store a community board. And that community board will typically talk about things that are happening in the community. Sometimes they're not kept quite as up to date. And they may not be quite as dynamic. And you might see lost cat up on there, right? So what we decided to do was to pilot this year, and Rodney, who's in the back, his team is leading this. We decided to pilot the idea of a touch screen. Can you walk into a Starbucks store and touch on the screen and find out what's happening? And that screen is managed by a local nonprofit. And not only can you find out what's happening, but you can sign up for things from that touch screen. And not only that, But we would love to see that evolve to you can actually Skype to a store in Beijing and talk about the things that are happening in their neighborhood versus yours, right? It's using technology and that's coming together in that connection as a force for good. So that's just one thought and one idea that we've started to pursue. I'm hoping from today that we have many others. And so I'd like to invite Eric back up up to the stage with me to just help us through this next phase Um, of this discussion, and I'm really hoping that we can come up with some great ideas. Obviously, at Starbucks, we won't be able to implement every one of them, but I can tell you if there's one thing I learned from that conversation with Howard that first day, and that I'm carrying through in my position and my role, we are eagerly listening, and we want to get this right. And by the way, I don't think we have yet, so please help us as we embark on this journey together. So uh, Blair, let me just, and we're gonna come back to Blair uh, in a few moments time uh, when we get a chance here to discuss uh, a a question, but I wanna just underscore something Blair has said here because he mentioned uh, a moment ago that he had uh, posed this set of questions and this uh, opportunity to a smaller group yesterday. Uh, And the smaller group yesterday was a group of civic leaders from around the country who have come together uh, to figure out how we strengthen a culture of citizenship here in the United States. And uh, at first, this room of leaders, all of whom are dynamic and many of whom are some of the speakers that we've been hearing all day long today, uh, weren't quite sure what to make of it uh, until I got back up there and said, hey, this is an unprecedented invitation you're getting here. The chief community officer at Starbucks, which is a role that was created for Blair Taylor, has come to you and said, we have a somewhat blank canvas here. We are looking at our 12,000 stores in the United States We are looking at all of this scale, and we have some ideas about how to deploy this scale for good, but we now want to extend an invitation to you as leaders, as citizens, as people engaged in various communities of how you might want to use that scale for good, how you might want to use that place, that space. And once we kind of put it on the table there, one of the things that helped move the conversation along was a theme and a topic of what it means to be, to explore self-interest. That was a theme that came up earlier this morning, the notion of self-interest in one of the table conversations here. And here's the reality. As Nick and I wrote in our book, uh, The the Gardens of Democracy, true self-interest is mutual interest. And recognizing that how we are in it together and how when we create something that benefits someone else, it will end up redounding to the benefit of me. Mm -hmm. And as Blair said, Starbucks Corporation is not a 501c3. Uh, It is a for-profit enterprise. Uh, And, not but, and uh, it is trying to figure out how, while operating in that way, it can use its scale for good to create opportunities for us to be more engaged and powerful citizens. So what we want to do right now is spend five or six minutes to allow all of you at your tables to have a conversation about what you would like to do on this blank canvas. How would you like to use Starbucks stores to help foster community, to create better citizens, to engage people in new ways? And then we're gonna harvest some of your ideas here um, and, uh, and, and collect those for, uh, for conversation. We're gonna now pull out some of the ideas from your table conversation, but there's no way we're gonna get all four or 500 of you um, here. So Twitter will be uh, that method. So um, Janae and Chris. Is Chris here? Okay. So we have uh, someone over here. Uh, Chris, um, if you'll bring the mic over here. And we want to hear from some of the ideas from, uh, from your table here. Is the mic coming to you? No problem. 
Hi. Oh, sorry. I am Sarah Dupree. I'm a high schooler from Seattle Academy here. And um, I was thinking of Starbucks as a culture maker. So I was talking to the owner of an independent coffee shop, and he was talking about how Starbucks, yes, was competition or whatever, but also had started this culture of coffee in America. And so if there was some way that Starbucks could create a culture of for-profit corporations um, having a focus in their communities, mm. I think that that would be greater than any specific um, spatial or any, creating a culture of for nonprofits, I think would be the greatest thing. That okay, great, Starbucks thank you, thank you very much. Let's, let's hear a few more. Um, and uh, uh, on, on this side, where's Janae? Right there. Okay. I'm sorry, I'm gonna come back to you. This woman has been raising her hand all day and I gotta get to it. Please stand up, I'll hold the mic. Well, I have a specific exam or request uh, and it could lead to a bigger idea. We have a Starbucks in a Safeway store on Bainbridge Island that is a gathering place for high school students of which there are lots of other things that shouldn't be going on that are going on at that Safeway store. Wouldn't it be interesting to partner with a, either our local Boys and Girls Club or our Bainbridge Youth Services or, or like Garfield High School's student-run court that some student represented, some way you bring the students to help represent themselves to build a better culture and create some kind of conversations or something that uplifts that, the quality of thought in that safe way. That's great. So a student it. voice baked into the development and the life of uh, a store's uh, uh, work in the community. Um, Chris, uh, where are you? I'm, I'm just going to turn to you. Okay, go ahead. Hi, I'm Paula Moran, and also with the Children's Alliance. Um, and I, my idea is to really use the notion of a portal, or to use local community stores as a portal for people and communities to be able to communicate with their elected officials. So that they can, so Starbucks would really be facilitating the communication. Mm -hmm. People could find out who their elected officials are and share information about their communities with those elected officials in a really low intimidating, a low intimidation kind of environment. Yeah, great, great suggestion. That's great. Um, I, I just want to keep uh, get, getting a quick, uh, quick tempo harvest here. Um, uh, Janae. Hello, my name is Ryan Prosser. I'm an educator in Tacoma Public Schools. Uh, Tacoma Schools uh, just passed a $500 million bond. We're the only innovative zone district in the state. And as we rebuild our schools, we're looking to create innovative spaces, learning centers, not just the old 20th century uh, buildings. It'd be great to have a Starbucks uh, space in school that could help. I mean, the, some of our schools are up to 90, 95% free reduced lunch, where we could create these spaces to help uh, create study centers, uh, spaces where students could have nutritious meals during lunchtime as an alternative to the cafeteria where they could go and study and just create these, these um, a, a culture of learning that goes beyond the, the classroom walls. Mm. Thank you. Great. Fantastic. Wow. Well, let's, let, let's get a couple more. Chris, uh, I'm, I'm just going to trust you to find, uh, and, and, and I'm, I'm, I want to say a word actually to Chris and Janae as you're going around. Um, we have incredible diversity in this room and I want that diversity to get reflected in who gets asked to uh, speak and report back from their tables. I say you just pick the person with the most energy, like the person. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Hi, I'm Ostrid Berg from Seattle, and this group wants to take the idea of Starbucks facilitating uh, talking to uh, political uh, decision makers one step further. We would like you to partner with Eric and to uh, enunciate an issue that is of concern nationwide. And in all 12,000 Starbucks shops, on the first Tuesday of every month, when we won't be voting, uh, we would have an LRC, a living room conversation, on that issue. You would be responsible for summarizing those results and sending them to the body or individuals or corporations who could most effectively accomplish our goal. Blair, I, so, I, I promise I did not put her up to yeah, that. I, I was okay. going to say, uh, so, you know, it's funny that you say that, and I, and I can't talk about this in any detail, but I will tell you we have had a very, very similar line of thinking and have started conversations with some major national media 
uh, companies to help us facilitate exactly what you just described. So I'm really thrilled that we're on the same page. So that's great. Okay, well, one more here, and then um, I, I want to uh, pull back to some of the uh, ideas being tweeted here. I'm Monica. I'm a student at the University of Washington, and our table talked a lot about nonprofits and how Starbucks can really engage in those nonprofits again. Um, so you all have the, if you bring your own mug, you get a discount on your coffee, but instead of having that discount just be a discount, have that money instead go towards a local nonprofit that would be around the area. Another, another great idea. Blair, um, I don't know if you want to digest some of these and respond to some of these, or do you want to uh, call in some more? What, what do you want to do? Let's keep these? going. These, All are, right. these are two. I want right. I'm soaking it in. Come okay. on, bring them. Good, good. Okay, Chris, over there. Okay, um, I'm Decker O'Donnell from Seattle Academy. Um, a lot of my table's ideas have been addressed, but one that I haven't heard yet is the idea that you can, you can put this out to the customers. Just put a box next to each cash register that says, like, what are your ideas? for like things that Starbucks could do to help. Yeah. And you know, like just incentivize the winner with like a $25 gift card, like once a week or something. Yeah. To just, just to get the customers who are actually paying for this coffee involved in the process, just yeah. like everyone. Yeah, appreciate that. And we do some of that online, but we need to do more of it in the stores. I think it's a great suggestion. Hi, my name is Johnson Dang. I'm also a University of Washington student. And my, oh yeah. And my table had this great discussion about having Starbucks become more of a free, organic, and more personalized um, space for people to gather and share experiences with. But the other flip side to that is also having Starbucks maybe commission a more localized flavor, as in um, local artists or local performers to come in and make, the, make it a nicer space. Yeah. Love so, it. so just real quick, in our community stores that I talked about earlier, where they're shared with a nonprofit, we're doing exactly that. They've got paintings that are up that are done by local artists, but we, we haven't quite gotten it right in our, in our larger set of stores, so it's a great suggestion. You know, one thing, Blair, I, I just wanted just to connect a couple of dots here. It's super interesting. This is something we talked about yesterday as well. Uh, jo Johnson's idea there underscores one of the, again, the, 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 these tensions inherent in, in this work here, right? We were talking earlier about one, the tension between understanding how everything is connected and networked and interdependent and how awesome that is, but on the other hand, it can be paralyzing because right. you don't know where to begin or where to stop, right? Another tension that Johnson's underscoring here is that scale is awesome, right? When you have 12,000 stores, we can push a button and hit 70 million transactions. That's awesome, but it also then makes it much harder to personalize, Absolutely. right? And one of the challenges and opportunities of citizenship in our age, not just at Starbucks, not just in politics, but just in general, is to figure out how we combine the best of network scale with still personalized, individualized sense of identity and place and voice. No. Um, and it seems to me that, uh, I mean, not just in these uh, 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 neighborhood stores that you're describing, uh, but uh, across the platform, um, there's an opportunity to experiment, yeah. right? And yeah. uh, th this invitation that you're putting forward here is in the spirit of experimentation. Absolutely. And, and, and that balance, that tension that you're describing, is, is what we are so focused on right now. Because the whole scale for good notion says, yeah, we have 12,000 stores US, 19,000 worldwide, but if we can't figure out how to make that store a vibrant part of the neighborhood, it doesn't matter. And what differentiates us, I think, as a brand is we sell great coffee, that's tremendous. But it's our people in the store who have that personal connection to each and every one of you that goes in and the, and the barista knows your name, and they know a little bit about what's happening in the community, and they have that kind of personal connection and conversation. And that is, that is the point of differentiation for us, candidly, and I think it's also the leap off point to allowing us to do much more good in the neighborhoods we're a part well, of. Well, as we've been talking, there's been this Twitter feed that's been uh, filling up, and there are more ideas I know coming in. Uh, we want to encourage you to keep on sending in those ideas, but uh, really, I just want to say that, um, a point that Blair made in passing and that um, uh, the student over here made, I think, about changing the culture of corporations uh, is one where, again, we have a voice as consumers. And this is actually where Annie's consumer and, and, and uh, citizen muscles uh, become one and the same. Because as consumers of businesses, large and small, uh, we get to demand and expect that the companies whose services and goods we purchase and, uh, and, and are and patronizing, that those institutions think of themselves more as citizens of our community, that they think of themselves as 
forces for good and catalysts for change. Uh, and again, that won't happen automatically. It won't happen just because. It will only happen because folks like us gathered here in a room will find ways to express voice, to take this kind of creativity and these kinds of ideas uh, and feed them and apply them across the breadth of business enterprises that we encounter in our lives as citizens and members of communities every day. Uh, and the example that Starbucks is setting here and that Blair that you're setting is one that I think we can press uh, other entities in the private sector to do as well. So can, please join can me. I, can, I, can I make one other comment? Yeah, yeah. Because t from, from my vantage point and from Starbucks' vantage point, um, as much as this is the right thing to do, this isn't a nice to do. We must figure out ways of getting more engaged. And, and from a very pragmatic, practical level, uh, we understand that the ability to run our business is contingent upon having well-qualified, great leaders, right, who are coming into that 200,000 employee pool. It's contingent upon people having an income and being able to uh, expend some of that income on our product. So we recognize that there's a balance here and that we need to be a part of that. And we also recognize something that I said in the beginning, and I just want to tell you one quick story. It'll take literally two minutes, Eric, about government, um, because I said that government will not get it done by themselves. And that doesn't mean that we're trying to replace government. It means we're trying to fill a gap that corporations can do. And a couple of years ago, I took a tour of the halls of Congress um, with a group. Um, and uh, I, there was a guy who was leading the tour who had been in Congress since 1963. And he, he was leading the tour, and I was up front with him, and I said, tell me what's the difference between Congress today and Congress in 1963. And this guy held up his hands and stopped the group. He said, hold up, hold up, everybody stop. This man asked me a question. I want everybody to hear the answer. He said, what's the difference between Congress today and Congress in 1963? He said, in 1963, into the 70s and into the 80s, he said, you'd see congressmen vehemently disagree on a topic or issue. And they'd argue with the bulging veins out of their neck. He said, but then they'd go out and order a steak and figure out how to write a piece of legislation. He said, you fast forward to today. And these Congress people from different parties won't even say hello to each other in the hallway anymore. So we have, a, we have a big problem with our government, right? We have a system of government that's nece that necessarily is predicated upon compromise, and we won't have people who are compromising anymore. So you layer that on top of all the other issues that we're facing, and it's mandatory that corporations jump in and do their part. Not to replace government, but in many instances, as was suggested by this table, to push and encourage government to do their job. And I think you've seen a lot of that from Howard Schultz, who's using his bully pulpit to do some of that. Anyway, it's been a pleasure. I know we probably took up too much time, and Eric's going to talk to me about it quietly <laughs> afterward. So thank that, you That's going to cost Starbucks in many ways. Thank you, Blair Taylor. <laughs>